Thank you very much. Um, just, just one small correction. Uh, I was the, when I was at UCT, I was the head of immunology. Not, not, I'm not an obstetrician or a gynecologist. <laughs> okay, so, so you're the experts, but, but what I'm hoping to do is to uh, uh, form collaborations uh, between what I can bring to the table and what you do uh, every day. So, okay. So, um, okay. Um, so Edward says, uh, has said I'm, I'm in the division of uh, molecular biology and human genetics, and I uh, have uh, got quite a, a large number of projects that I've pulled across from UCT to, to here that all involve looking in the placenta. Um, so um, f for those of you who um, delve a little bit into philosophy and um, sort of the past and some histrionics, um, I pulled out this quote, and it's from a, a, a book called Life's Vital Link. Uh, and it uh, was written by um, uh, Y.W. W. Yoke, um, and he's at the Cambridge Trophoblast Center. Uh, and they entirely are focused on the trophoblasts in the placenta. He says, the history of man for the nine months preceding his birth would probably be far more interesting and contains events of greater moment than all the three score and 10 years that follow it. And I think the significance of that is because everything that determines health most likely in the newborn and subsequent to that in the three score 10 years probably occurs in the placenta. So therefore, let's look at the placenta. And my interest, of course, is immunology. And we're looking at the I I immune responses in the placenta. So um, I also like to show this because it's a, a, an etching drawn by Leonardo da Vinci 500 years ago. Um, he did look at cows uh, and look at, at the developing fetuses in cows uh, and extrapolated that to the human. And you can see that the, 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 the picture on the, the, the etching on, on the left uh, is incredibly accurate with the umbilical cord. But what's missing? What's missing is the placenta. Uh, and there you see on the, on the right the three-dimensional scan uh, of the baby with the placenta, the umbilical cord uh, coming from the placenta into the baby. Now, this, this year is the 60th anniversary of Peter Medawar uh, getting the Nobel Prize in 1961 uh, for um, uh, um, identifying and defining acquired immunological tolerance. Um, and in a sense, the fetus uh, and the placenta are semi-allogeneic. In other words, they are half paternal and half maternal. And it's been a model for transplantation immunology for many years. And as an immunologist, there can be no more challenging uh, concept than tolerance. What, what is tolerance and what induces tolerance, i.e., that, that is the equilibrium between the immune equilibrium between something that is foreign and something that is not foreign. And the fetus is that perfect organ, if you like, uh, or the placenta is that perfect organ, and the fetus, of course, is the newborn. So it's really that balance between tolerance and rejection. In solid organ transplantation, for example, uh, um, uh, the holy grail is to, is, to, is, is to arrive at tolerance where you don't have to immunosuppress the patient. But, but the, the mother is naturally immunosuppressed, and we're still trying to this day to find out why. So it's a very much an immunolo immunological conundrum, uh, and that's any conundrum I'm therefore extremely interested in, something that is not so obvious. Also, just to say that my background uh, is, is, is in HIV. I'm an HIV immunologist. I've been looking at HIV and studying HIV immunology for the past 20 or so years. And what's even more of a conundrum, and we'll come on to that, is the impact of HIV and any infection for that matter, not just HIV, but specifically that's my interest, HIV, maternal HIV, on the developing infant and how that impacts on the placenta. So what contributes to the breakdown or the maintenance of maternal fetal tolerance. 
Well, I think what you see in, in circled in, on the right is inflammation. I think that is one concept that we can probably all grapple with quite easily is that anything that involves inflammation, the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, the, uh, the, 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 the pathology that results from that uh, is one cause of an adverse birth event or outcome uh, and in terms of uh, what's going on in the placenta. So, so, so my focus is really on that, that interplay with infection, inflammation, and the placenta. There are many, many other factors shown here that could cause a breakdown of maternal fetal tolerance. So I don't need to tell you at all about the HIV epidemic. Um, and this is just showing you the, the, the this, is this is data derived from the most recently published household survey from the Human Sciences Research Council. Uh, already it's three years out of date in terms of its publication, and which means that it took probably two years prior to that to accumulate the data. So things have moved on a lot since this, but it's, it's, it's the evidence that, that is there at the moment. And if you look at the difference between the male and female prevalence of HIV in the general population, you can see by far that it's the females that um, are the uh, most affected in terms of HIV infection than males. Bear in mind that these are incredibly high prevalence rates, whatever we, whatever we say, but it's relative to each other, the female, and especially in the boxed dotted line <clears throat> is, is obviously those uh, women who, who would be of childbearing age. And so you have a large body or a large uh, population of HIV positive women who uh, are falling pregnant. Um, uh, and, and we need to know uh, how we can mitigate the impact of this infection on adverse birth outcomes. Of course, having said that, the Western Cape is the lowest, I think, prevalence uh, relative to the rest of the country, but that doesn't mean to say that it's not, not a huge issue. So we also know that um, there's a, the antiretroviral treatment program is, is very mature. It's been going for more than a decade now in terms of viral suppression. And uh, you can see here um, that uh, we have achieved, on the whole, 90% suppression in both uh, males and females. But this gives rise to a whole different ballgame because you're, you're preventing vertical transmission because you have very good viral suppression, but you have the impact of the antiretroviral drugs potentially on the developing fetus. And we don't quite know the impact of different ARVs on, uh, some may cause inflammation, some may cause um, um, aberrant pathology, which we need to know about. And the other offshoot of this is that many women are giving now birth to HIV-exposed but uninfected children. And this is um, data from Amy Slogrove, uh, published um, uh, last year um, in, in Lancet Global Health, showing the proportion of HIV-exposed infants uh, that are born in different countries. Uh, and you can see that South Africa are making up a, a very large almost uh, a quarter of, of the uh, population of exposed uninfected children on the continent. Um, and if you actually look at the numbers, i.e., and, and, the, and the, 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 the numbers are uh, above each bar, each graph represent the prevalence of HIV exposed uninfected infants. You can see that South Africa here is by far uh, the largest population uh, that, that there are HIV-exposed uninfected children. So it, it's, a, it's an issue, and we know from prior data from various uh, groups investigating the impact of either H maternal HIV or exposure to HIV and treatment of the mother that this does give rise to birth complications, whether it's preterm birth, low birth weight, 
uh, small for gestational age and stillbirth. Stillbirth is a huge issue uh, facing South Africa in terms of the HIV epidemic and, and ARV treatment. And in fact, you can see here that ARV-treated maternal HIV infection gives rise uh, to preterm deliveries. And this was a, 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 a Malaba is at the Un University of Cape Town. This was uh, uh, data derived from, from uh, Google Edge. Uh, and also, ARV prior to conception um, gives, gives rise to these um, aberrant or adverse birth outcomes. And of course, preterm birth has a profound impact on uh, pulmonary function, uh, uh, atopic asthma, neurodevelopment symptoms, uh, increased blood pressure, diabetes. So, so it's, these are huge issues that we're being faced with uh, whilst we're hopefully eradicating vertical transmission of HIV. Um, it, it brings a whole new set of dilemmas and challenges uh, to, the, to the newborn infant. So, Therefore, what I'm going to tell you about are two studies that, we've, that I've been involved with, um, and that is looking at placental pathology and the timing of antiretroviral treatment, whether antiretroviral treatment started during pregnancy or before pregnancy, and the impact that had and has on the uh, placenta in terms of gross pathology. Then I'm going to tell you about a second study where uh, we embedded ourselves in, uh, opportunistically into a study giving dolutegravir, the integrase inhibitor, uh, very, very late in pregnancy, around week 28, so the beginning of the third trimester, uh, for safety reason, um, especially since uh, data from Botswana showed that giving dolutegravir prior to conception uh, gave rise to neural tube defects, uh, about 1 or 2 percent. Uh, prevalence. So that hence allowed us to look uh, in greater depth or greater uh, or, um, sort of, um, shall we say, the, the, the infant or the placenta was going to be exposed to HIV for much longer than, than would normally be the case because these women were drug naive before starting on dolitogravir. So let's talk about the two studies. Um, one, the first one uh, took place in Guguletu. The second one uh, took place in combined Guguletu and Kailicha. And the question we were asking, is the placenta a link between maternal immune status and the newborn infant immune status, knowing full well that the newborn infant has some deficits, has some immunological deficits, where we don't know what the origin or the cause is. So that was our research question. So, sub question, study one: Is the timing of antiretroviral treatment exposure sparing on the placenta? So this was uh, the first line regimen: tenofovir, uh, FTC, and efavirenz. And we uh, nested ourselves into a large study looking at the, 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 the outcome was preterm birth or small for gestational age, uh, whether they were given treatment prior to or, or initiating treatment during uh, gestation. So um, they initiated treatment. Those, the group that initiated, which we call the uh, initiating group versus the stable group, which are the ones that were on long-term treatment, were initiated at around 15 weeks of gestation. Uh, so ultrasound was used to more accurately gauge the, uh, the, um, the time of gestation so that, it, so that um, term, preterm, or can, and divided into early and late preterm could be defined in a more uh, defined way rather than using the, the, the last menstrual uh, period timing. So incidentally, this was an NIH-funded study, and we, as I said, nested ourselves in, into that. And of course, that leads itself to investigator bias a lot. Uh, so but what I'm going to show you, I think, has uh, some kind of um, um, fruit, and we ended up publishing this, in, and you can see the paper referenced down at the foot there. So we had 53 women in the stable ART group, and 77 women in the initiating ART group, and we collected placentas at term. 
and we then, very s simple analysis, fixed the placentas, sent them off to the pathology lab, and they looked uh, for macroscopic inspection, a basal plate weight, cord length, cord insertion, uh, and then the histopathology, whether, whether it was inflammation, chorionitis, uh, or cord vessel vasculitis, being either maternal or fetal, markers of fetal or maternal inflammation, focal infarction, and, and uh, the impact of meconium exposure. So some of you, are, probably all of you, know what placentas look like, but, but, but the cord insertion uh, is, is a very, very, and I was, remember I'm an immunologist and not an ops and gynae person. So the, the cord insertion uh, is a marker in, for me as an immunologist of some kind of placental dysfunction, some kind of placental um, abnormal growth, uh, which could well be linked to the, to the immune process. So if we look at the histological examination, so we, we carefully dissected the placenta. So after we took sections and took fixed them and sent them to pathology, we, we took parts of the placenta very, very carefully teasing out the decidua basalis, the maternal membranes, decidua basalis and the decidua peritalis. And they're two very different membranes. Uh, and they have different immuno immunological makeups. So we separated that very, very carefully. And then we took sections of the villus tissue. And we washed very, very carefully. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit of that in, 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 in time. Uh, and then we, we um, embedded some of that into uh, optimal cutting media as well as paraffin embeddation. So I just want to turn straight to the data and show you the results. So here is a forest plot showing, so this is the initiating, this is the group that initiated during pregnancy, and this is the uh, ARV uh, that were prior to pregnancy, the stable group. And on this side, you have, uh, um, as I said, the timing. And on the right side, you have the presence of pathology. So meconium exposure, corium anemiaitis, uh, vascular um, uh, uh, vessel, vessel inflammation, uh, um, chronic deciduitis, and maternal vascular malperfusion. And what we found is that the women who were on stable antiretroviral treatment had a two-fold increase risk of maternal vascular malperfusion. And when we corrected for hypertension and for age, uh, it still was significant. So this alluded to us that, um, that ARV given prior to conception uh, was leading to some form of placental uh, malfunction or dysfunction, uh, classified as MVM. We also found that the, there was an association with MVM with preterm delivery. So overall, in the overall cohort, there was no association uh, between initiating or stable ARV with the birth outcomes. But when we nested ourselves and took these samples and looked at the MVM uh, uh, with preterm delivery, we found that this was a significant uh, association. So uh, this would suggest that there is a placenta-mediated mechanism that links the putative association with long-term use of antiretroviral treatment with adverse birth outcomes. So this study enabled us to provide that placental link, uh, which, which may be an extremely important factor for perhaps mitigating uh, the impact of long-term ARV treatment. So the second study is where we then delved a little bit in depth and looked at T cells. Now, uh, I'm aware that most of you probably last heard the word T cell some of you maybe 20, 30 years ago, some of you maybe five years ago, whatever. So let me just remind you what a T cell is. So um, there are broad, two broad types of T cells. I can see, yes, you remember those medical school days where you didn't understand the lecture. I, I've been there. So there are two broad T cells. 
CD4s and CD8 T cells. So within the CD4 T cell, these can be broken down even further into different subsets. And we know that these can be divided into Th1, Th2, Th9, Th17, and so on. Don't worry about that. It it's just it denotes a type of function of these cells. So the CD4 cell is a helper cell, and they help other cells of the immune system, including themselves, that are incestuous like that, uh, by releasing cytokines. And the type of cytokines that they release, we, we denote them by a profile, Th1, Th2. The CD8 cells are involved in, certainly in the circulation with um, cytotoxic killing of virally infected cells. So for example, the, the COVID-19 vaccines, uh, whilst everyone is focused on the neutralizing antibodies and antibodies, the, probably the mechanism preventing hospitalization and death is in fact a T cell mediated immune response. So it's these T cells that I'm talking about. And there's one type of T cell, which I won't talk about now, uh, maybe in another talk, when, 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 if you want to invite me back, as I, 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 is, is T regulatory cells. And these are very, now the, the placenta, as I said at the beginning, is that almost like an immune privileged organ, it, 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 it's not rejected, and we don't know why. So the, there's a lot of immune regulation going on to prevent the impact of inflammation or the impact of something that is happening to prevent that rejection, that maternal rejection. And we think it's those regulatory cells. And, and there are many types of regulatory cells, but I won't go into them. The bottom line is that there are, could well be these inflammatory CD4 cells that precipitate and break this tolerance. So we want to look, and I'm going to show you um, about um, uh, just the very broad CD4s and CD8s, nothing, nothing as an esoteric as the Th1s, Th2s, or the t Um So that's the balance between, but I won't go into that in this talk. So, so the hypothesis here, um, where we're looking at this homeostatic balance, so in HIV infection, you have a homeostatic imbalance. You have an inverted ratio. In a normal person, you, you know, your CD4s would be at a higher proportion than your CD8s. In HIV infection, it's completely the other way around. You have more CD8s and lower CD4s. And of course, the hallmark of HIV disease progression is that CD4s get lower and lower and lower. So the hypothesis here is that maternal HIV infection is causing an imbalance of T cells in the placenta. And the reason why we have that hypothesis is because we know that in the HIV-exposed uninfected infant, these infants tend to be born with lower CD4s in the HIV-positive mum. So is the mum, is the mother having this impact on the infant via the placenta? So as I, said, as I mentioned before, um, there, this was nested in another study looking at the impact of dolutegravir actually on, the in, in, uh, on birth outcomes, but in terms of inflammation. And here we took uh, placentas, uh, or we recruited women at late stage, and we collected placentas at term. And here we um, also compared with uh, a control group um, uh, from the same location, these were women who were uh, not on any treatment because they were not HIV infected. Um, so the, in other words, the babies were, were healthy newborns. Um, so I won't go into this in any detail because it, but I, what I want is, is to give you a snapshot that this processing, and I see some of the lab, my lab are here, some of the processing of the placentas uh, takes 12 hours over two days, i.e. 12 hours and six hours, probably one 12 hours and one six hours the next day. It's a lengthy process because what we're doing is we're completely washing off maternal blood. We don't want to, we're not interested in maternal, the intervillous blood. We're interested in what's happening in the tissue. So these tissue resident cells in the placenta, that's what we're after. So if we look at the data, let me take you through it. Um, here, 
in blue is the peritalis, the deciduous membrane. Green is the basalis, and the red is the villus tissue. So we're looking in the fetal tissue. And what we're doing is we're liberating the cells from the tissue. So these are not maternal cells uh, in terms of the maternal blood. I'm not saying that they may not be maternal cells. They might be there in, in the tissue. But we're liberating them from the tissue. And these are from the HIV-negative mothers, and these are from the HIV-positive mothers. And you can immediately see there's a lower CD4 proportion in the peritalis membrane from the HIV-positive mothers. And that is also true in the basalis, but not true in the villus tissue. There's kind of equal proportions in the villus tissue. If we look at the CD8s, remember I, I said there was um, uh, um, um, uh, inverted ratio, CD4, CD8. So here, sorry, my phone is not around. So here, um, there's an inverted ratio. You see the lower, lower CD4s, but higher CD8s in the peritalis, uh, in the HIV positive mums, the basalis, and this time in the villus tissue. We find more CD8 cells in the villus tissue from the HIV positive mums. Now that, that is a, a unique finding. That's not, usually when you find, well it's not unique, and I'll tell you why it's not unique. Usually f when you find CD8 cells in the villus tissue, it comes with villitis. It comes with um, inflammation of, of the villus tissue. And it's mostly either caused by an infection where the, CD8, the maternal CD8 cells are crossing uh, over into the villus tissue to react with, with the antigens of the infection. CMV, for example, would be one. Or it's an allogeneic response that may have been precipitated by a infection. Allogeneic means the cells are recognizing foreign. So these are maternal cells that are recognizing probably paternal antigens uh, on, on the surface of, uh, of the trophoblast. So that's our first observation. Now our second observation was when we started looking at the viral load. Um, so what you're seeing on, on the right, on, sorry, on the left, these are, the, these are the viral loads in the women prior to being put onto either efavirenz or dolutegravir. And you can see there's a very huge range of viremia uh, going up to almost six logs, which is kind of what you'd expect from maybe a pregnant woman who is drug naive and not on treatment. Uh, what you can see uh, in blue and because this is opportunistic, we had five in the dolutegravir and, and we had uh, six, uh, uh, 16 in the efavirenz arm. So we can't compare really the, the two drug regimens. But what we could do is we could look at the kinetics of viral load suppression. And you can see certainly in the dolutegravir, they were virally suppressed uh, by four weeks prior to delivery. Uh, so at the time of delivery, they were virally suppressed, which was unlike the women on the efavirenz-based treatment where there was uh, a, a, a proportion of women who were not virally suppressed. Even though there was no vertical transmission, they were not virally suppressed. And this is just showing that there's this expected inverse relationship in the systemic circulation of the mother prior to antiretroviral treatment at week 28 with the, viral CD, the CD4 counts and the viral load in the blood of the mother. Now, if we look at the similar associations with what's happening in the mother and what's happening in the placenta, we, we come to some very interesting observations. Here is the enrollment CD4 in the mother. And here is the uh, 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 placenta CD4. So this would be in the decidua membranes. And there is a positive association between the maternal CD4 count and the CD4s that we isolate from the decidua. Now, that may not be surprising in the sense because the decidua are maternal membranes and they would reflect what's happening in the systemic circulation. But what is surprising is that this is separated by at least 12 weeks of time. So what is ha whatever is happening at 28 weeks of uh, pregnancy, of gestation, is still mirrored. Uh, 
uh, even when there is viral suppression in the deciduous membranes. If we look at the villous tissue CD4s, uh, it's, it's, not, it's marginally, it's marginally non-significant, but there is this positive association. And when we look at cord blood, not really enough data, but again, may be positive there. Now, if we look at then at now at the viral loads and how that associates with the different cell subsets in the placenta. So here you've got the enrollment viral load. This is a week 28 prior to being put onto treatment, whether it be one arm or the other. And here is the peritalis CD4. Uh, and this is the villous tissue CD4s. Uh, and I'm just showing you the peritalis because the basalis is the same, identical. And it is this inverse ratio. So the higher the viremia in the mother prior to treatment, the lower the CD4 later uh, at delivery in the, in the deciduous membrane. So there's, a, there's an aspect of time, but there's also an aspect of reflection, hence the word footprint. And this is also reflected in the villous tissue. But also, I think very significantly, you see this increased CD8 presence, this presence of CD8 cells, which we don't know quite what they're doing in the villous tissue, but they're there, and they're increased in proportion relative to the viremia in the mother. So the higher the viral load in the untreated mother, then she's put onto treatment, then we take the placenta at term, we find higher CD8 cells in the villous tissue. So the first question we wanted to ask is, well, are these CD8 cells from the mother? Are they maternal or are they fetal? So um, what we did is we then took we looked at our tissue sections uh, with, that we had prepared, and we looked at the, uh, the location of these cells in the tissue. And we find, and I'm sorry, you probably can't see this hugely well. This is, uh, this is from the uninfected. But in the infected tissues, we find, especially if you look here, we find that these CD8 cells are in the fetal capillaries. So they're not necessarily in the tissue although we can't discount that because we, you know, this was um, not a hugely in-depth uh, imaging study, which we would well want to expand. But in the data that we have, they, we find them in the, in the fetal capillaries. And in fact, when we count the numbers of cells, as opposed to the proportion, we see that it completely mirrors what we found using the proportional uh, relative uh, proportions uh, in the tissue using a, a flow cytometry approach, where there was increased numbers of the CD8 cells in the villous tissue. So to identify where they're from, so we took male fetuses and we did uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization and looked for the XY chromosome. So of course the male fetus would have the uh, XY and the mother would be XX. And we, look, we were looking for the Y chromosome. And what we identified, and this completely now fits with the fact that we didn't find any velitis, no, none, in any of these placentas. What we found is that these cells were actually fetal. They weren't maternal. So the fetal cells are appearing in the villous tissue. Now, why would that be? Because normally these cells would flow in my simplistic, and maybe you can tell me otherwise, it would flow from villous tissue through the umbilical cord and into the infant, into the, into the neonate. So it's almost like we're having a backflow or a contamination of cord blood back into the, the fetus, into the villous tissue. So why? Well, actually, we have no idea why, and that's our next stage of research, uh, is what's happening in these... Uh, in the villous tissue, especially with the trophoblasts, that may be uh, causing this attraction of cells, in my view, counterflow to what I would normally expect. But I, I, I'd like to hear your, your take on that too. So the take home message is that the placenta is the link between long term effects of antiretroviral treatment and adverse birth outcomes. So that, that's, that's one link that we're wanting to make. And I think we've, we've partly made some of that link, not fully. Maternal viremia prior to antiretroviral treatment, this second study I told you about, or B28, 
has a durable impact on the proportions of T cells that we found, those CD4s and CD8s. And that the maternal CD4 counts, uh, which would be a marker of immune competence in the HIV-infected mum, um, correlates with the overall T cell events in the placenta. And that's where the title of my talk has come from. So the placenta has a footprint of maternal immunity in the context of HIV infection. And I, I hypothesize and predict that HIV is just accentuating what is there anyway, even if you look in uninfected uh, in, in, uh, mums, that the placenta is always going to reflect at some level what's happening in the maternal circulation. And with HIV, it's just far more pronounced. So we can conclude that the T cell homeostatic imbalance in the mother is then reflected in the placenta. So what, it, what does this mean? So what? So um, in terms of maternal immune health, if you have poor maternal immune health, you have immune imbalance in the placenta. And the next stage of what we're trying to do is that poor immune imbalance in the placenta, is it related to inflammation? Is it related to aberrant regulation, those regulatory cells, giving rise to a rejection event, which might be construed in this sense as an adverse birth outcome? And in good immune health, um, you have immune balance. There, there is a level of good tolerance, if you like, where, where the placenta is well balanced, the infant is born, and everything is, is balanced out, um, and leading to a healthy newborn. So I think we're at the first stage of trying to unravel events in the placenta. And we've written a couple of, we being my team, we've written a couple of grants uh, to the NIH, and luckily they've got funded. And that, those are the funds that I've brought across to Selimorsh. And I, I'm standing here because I want to work with you. I want to collaborate with you uh, and to understand what is happening in, especially with the trophoblasts, what might be happening in those cells that might be attracting these CD8 cells into the placenta. Or um, we have a study looking at preterm birth or, and, and small for gestational age. How is the microbiome in the female vaginal uh, constituents and the, and the metabolites influencing inflammation in the placenta, giving rise to adverse birth outcomes. So um, this is what I'm going to be doing here uh, over the next five years, is developing this Reproductive Immunology Research Consortium, which is really to focus on the infectious disease uh, that disrupts immune, immune regulation. So I'm really focused on what, what, what disrupts immune regulation, because that, that's what life is, and the end of life is all about, disruption of immune regulation. So it could be inflammation leading to pathology, or it could be uh, an overregulation uh, leading to um, uh, other complications. Um, identifying immune risks uh, that give rise to preterm birth, uh, and to identify predictors. So this has been a very large study, these two studies that I've outlined, and um, I have um, collaborators in many parts of the globe, but, but um, centered around what we do here. Um, so over the next few months, my, my lab at UCT will be moving across, and has already, that's already started, and we'll be setting up uh, a whole, um, reproductive immunology lab uh, that can work hopefully with you. So thank you. You can take questions at any time. Mr. Guy, thank you very much for an for excellent talk and congratulations on the excellent research and your publications. And this future is, I think, this is what a lot of clinicians dream of to achieve one day in their lives and good luck at the NHI I'm, 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 I'm certain it will be successful and uh, it's, it's uh, will create a lot of opportunities for us and uh, 
and uh, so we're all excited about it and we, we look forward to working with you. Um, any any questions? Who's your, who's your laboratory personnel? Welcome to you as well. The tier. It's just the tier. It seems like it's long. I think we complain and we do work, but this also looks like hard, very, very difficult work, and it's impressive that laboratory work, very, very impressive. Um, so going back to the talk, uh, any any questions from the floor? Excellent talk, Prof. I found it very interesting. Um, I noticed with the first study, the results you presented, that um, quite a large proportion of those presented showed maternal vascular malperfusion. Yes. And in obstetrics, we're very interested in maternal vascular malperfusion because it's um, related to many adverse outcomes. Yeah. I might have um, understood your, or not, I might have not understood the data well, but can you maybe explain um, why, or if you think this maternal vascular malperfusion is directly related to the HIV status of the mother, or if it's related to the ARV she's on? And then I'd like to follow that up with a question for Professor Hall when you're done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that is such a spot on question. I'm, I'm not sure from this study because we did not have an HIV uninfected arm. What we need in that, for that to answer your question, which is a fantastic question, is we need, we need pregnant women on ARVs in a PrEP format, pre-exposure prophylaxis, where they're on antiretrovirals, but they're not HIV infected. We, there's no ways I can answer that question from the data because we, don't, we haven't got that control group. So that's what we need to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pauli. So I think that but this, we often, we have a, you're welcome to join the meetings as well. Mm. But on Thursdays, we have a combined meeting where we have a perinatal mortality meeting. And right. then one and one of the sessions, there's uh, most of them, if there was adverse outcomes, then, they, then the presenter will go for histology. Yeah. And then we have a pathologist, Paul Schubert, that, Paul Schubert that you know well, and then he will, he will, he will report to us in terms of what the outcomes was. And we often find unexplained maternal vascular malperfusion or fetal vascular malperfusion. And I think we don't put enough emphasis in whether the patient was HIV positive or not. We don't discuss with what ARV regimen she was on. So this is, this is, this is very important. We have to take that into consideration. Then your uh, Prof. Hall, uh, Pali, your question and comment. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Prof. Um, so if we think that HIV or ARV use is associated with maternal vascular malperfusion, should we not be um, initiating aspirin early in pregnancy to try and prevent this problem? So you, you've got it. What are you actually preventing with aspirin therapy? What do you know you're influencing? And, and we don't know enough about what we're influencing mm. at the level that um, we've heard in the presentation. What we know is that we, we're influencing two, two things at two different parts of pregnancy. One is we're inf influencing vascular remodeling, and I didn't hear anything about vascular remodeling in the talk there, and whether those placentas did have appropriate vascular remodeling. Um, and that, it, that will be before the first phase, in other words, in the first trimester, and perhaps up to 16 to 18 weeks. That's the one part, and that's built into the ISSHP recommendations. The other part that, that I'm more interested in is the continuous effect of, on the prostaglandin prostacyclin imbalance, which has got nothing actually to do with the trophoblast invasion of the spiral arteries. And that stays there all the way through pregnancy. And, we, and, and we've got robust information at the moment to know about both of those sets. So we know that to transfer that knowledge, to translate that knowledge into, into what we're hearing today, we're not there yet, and that's why we need more, yeah. more information. But my question would be, is that in the field of hypertension, um, a fair amount of work was done quite a long time ago, I'm talking about 30, 40 years ago, with the pattern in terms of immune tolerance, because preeclampsia is a multifactorial disease, but one of the, one of the elements of that is immune tolerance. And a fair amount of research was done, and we contributed to that about 15 years ago, mm. uh, about the paternal contribution to immune tolerance. And, that, and, and the finding up, the study that we did here, was basically in accordance with other studies that if the sexual cohabitation unprotected, and this was at a difficult time of the HIV mm. epidemic, if that exposure 
of the female reproductive tract to paternal antigens, seminal antigens, yeah. was greater than six months, the risk of preeclampsia was substantially lower which fitted in with the, the original hypothesis, which said it's a disease of multi-gravid women. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so I wondered if you've had any experience or readings on that yourself. Um, the bottom, bottom line, no. <laughs> but but um, when, when we, uh, what was interesting is that the HIV, the women who were, uh, that first study, in fact, both studies, um, there were a very large number of multigravid women. Uh, and and we'd look, we didn't have the numbers to tease or pass them out to know what effect that had on, on our finding. But it would be, I think, really interesting to re-look at that data in terms of what we now know might be worsening of tolerance even though we're not quite sure fully yet, but, but the new tools that we have to at our disposal. Um, but no, I, I've not looked at that. Maybe it would be good to explore more with you, actually, at that question. I think that's, a, that's something, that would be something new for me. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? so much, Prof, for your wonderful talk. Um, my question follows Polly's question. Those women who have been on ARVs prior conception which turned out to have MVM um, on their placentas, have you looked at the duration of their therapy? Like maybe those ones who have been on ARVs mm -hmm. for more than 10 years, mm -hmm. 20 years, months, and if you did, there were, was there any significant uh, difference yeah. between them? No, a really good question as well. Um, and we, have, we don't have that data. We don't know how long they've been infected. We don't know how long they've been in treatment. The only group that we are in, was, that we had contained and defined was the initiating group. Yeah. So, I mean, absolutely. We, it's, it's a hole in the, in the, in the study. But I'm, you know. No, no, absolutely. Professor Gray, this is a question from, from me. So it seems like there's a new group that emerged. In the past, we had HIV positive, HIV negative. We started treating, but we did. But what you're saying, I always wondered about this. Why are we not seeing better, better perinatal outcomes in the HIV women, even though they are on treatment? Mm -hmm. But then the women that's been on treatment for a long time, it seems that they then form a, a, a new immune group. And that, per se, affects their so, but, so they still don't have a normal immune system. They still a dysregulated immune system. They, even though they're on treatment, they still CD4, CD8 mm. dysregulation, and that impacts the placenta and fetus. And if you if you treat them, then you change that 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 system again. And the, and your feeling. So your main thing is: is it the is the adverse outcomes because of the drugs, or is it because of the effect of the drugs on the immune system and then placenta to fetus? Is that correct? So, so I would say that uh, what, how I would interpret simulation is that whether you, even if you effectively treat the, the, the mothers, and that was truly the case with Dolly Shekubel, um, that is not reflected in the placenta. You still have this imbalance. Um, so, so it's almost like there is a, um, a durable impact of whatever was there prior to treatment. It's, it's not being it's not being reversed or it's not being you're not getting immune or reconstitution to a to a more equilibrated balance which is what we would find in the healthy placenta so um, uh, so I lost the train now your question was what <laughs> no, it's just, uh, it's just uh, uh, so I was just saying that it seems that with HIV um, it was just in the women that's been on treatment for a longer period of time, even though you treat the HIV, they still in, there's still an impact on the immune system. They still don't have a oh, normal, yeah. they don't yeah. have a normal balance. And no. um, by treating it, you still you change something and there might still be some effect Absolutely. on the same time. Yes, 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 uh, Any other questions from the floor? I think it's, I think it's, uh, 
unfair to say that we haven't improved the situation with antiretrovirals, having been in both eras. I mean, the, the fact that we're having massive proportions of children born HIV negative mm. is, is an incredible step forward. Mm. To say that we brought it back to normality is clearly not, not correct. Mm. Um, and, and also the philosopher in me says, I'm still worried that women are, are not being um, careful about how they reproduce. They are exercising their reproductive autonomy very liberally. Instead of saying, I'm an HIV positive patient that's on treatment with low CD4 count, I'm still not normal. I will therefore be careful about how I exercise that right, knowing that, that there are still consequences, etc., etc. So, so I think we've made huge steps forward. I mean, I went overseas as a young, as a young professional in the AIDS denialism era in South Africa, and we faced great hostility from our colleagues um, over there. And, and now to have this rollout where we have HIV exposed but negative children, that's an enormous step forward. Um, so we can't say, it, we, we, we're not at normal and we might never get there, but, but that has been really good. I think for us, the, the people, especially the impact on maternal mortality, I think this is the one big thing that we, that we did over the last decade is to decrease maternal mortality and perinatal mortality. But I think what we meant is that even we, uh, even though we've got the program going, that we're still seeing that, 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 this, that the perinatal mortality outcomes is not, it's, it's much improved, but it's still not what we expected. So if you have HIV, whether you're on treatment or not, there's still an increased risk for, for the fetus. And uh, when we look at the numbers in the, in the group of the HIV prevalence, it's still very, very high, and that is sad after so many years. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Um, hi there, Prof. Uh, so just with regards to the earlier question about is it the uh, drug or is it actual HIV that is affecting the health of uh, the placenta and then also subsequently the um, neonate? Would you consider looking at maybe a pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic branch to your study, um, considering that this could be an aspect that you can explore? And my second question is with regards to the, um, I don't want to say compromised immune system, but sort of alternative immune system that these new infants have. Um, that are HIV um, uninfected but exposed, would you look then at how they have developed, maybe in the first five years or maybe in the first 10 years of their life, how they have responded to disease? Mm -hmm. um, th so yeah, that's my question. Is those two branches, would you ever consider looking at that um, in your research? So, so let me address the, the second question first, is that, um, um, I think what's important in any of the research that I would do as an immunologist in trying to link that with, with placental morphology and function um, is, is to link it with long-term outcomes. Uh, what, is, what, is the, what is neurocognition like in five years? What is language development like? What is uh, schooling like? What is that, that to me is the essence of what I do, but I would need to work with people who do that, mm. because that's, that then becomes really significant. Doing this as I present it to you with outcomes is um, at birth, it's a, it's a so what scenario, mm. I can be self-critical. It needs to be in relation, I think, to a longer term vision. The first question about pharmacokinetics here. Uh, uh, um, um, certainly, the, you know, which, which drug gets into the placenta and what does it do? Is that what you mean? Yeah, sure. That's, that's what I was asking. Yeah. Um, about how we can consider investigating um, the various drugs, how they, the impact. How they move and how, what's the impact, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, the earlier comment about trophoblasts and, and remodeling and spiraling, it would be wonderful to have, um, to look in first and second trimesters, uh, what we do, because that's, that's probably where it all takes place in the first trimester. What we're looking at at term, it 
it's all done, finished. It's all, all complete, but it, so we're, we're kind of measuring uh, something that's happened way weeks before. But it's, it's what we have at the moment. Last question. The last comment links to that. That is the HIV field and the and the specific agents we use are move so quickly that every time we're getting data on on a specific drug um, and applying it to the situation, it's it's like so yesterday. Mm. Um, so and they don't, they don't. Because we're actually dealing with this now and we're at the next step. Yeah. And 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 if we're dealing with dolutegravir, that's great, but tomorrow it's going to be the new agent that's rolling in. So you have to, it's, it just moves so fast, it's actually quite difficult to keep up like that. For me, what this uh, main place is, is the way that you look at the placenta, separating, separating all the different, because the placenta is very, is very complex, and uh, but that looking at each different one and, and seeing where is, at what level is a problem. And I think that is what we maybe need in pre here as well. We, uh, so for us, pre here is still, we don't have the answers. We, we uh, like Professor Hall said, at, at stage only in immun immunology and how it's more anti-angiogenic factors. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of potential, I think, for interaction in the future. Mm -hmm. So thank you again for your for your presentation. What are you actually preventing with aspirin therapy? What do you know you're influencing? And and we don't know enough about what we're influencing mm -hmm. at the level that. Um, We've heard in the presentation. What we know is that we, we're influencing two two things at two different parts of pregnancy. One is we're inf influencing vascular remodeling, and I didn't hear anything about vascular remodeling in the talk there, and whether those placentas did have appropriate vascular remodeling. Um, and that it, that will be before the first phase, in other words, in the first trimester, and perhaps up to 16 to 18 weeks. That's the one part, and that's built into the ISSHP recommendations. The other part that, that I'm more interested in is the continuous effect of on the prostaglandin prostacyclin imbalance, which has got nothing actually to do with the trophoblast invasion of the spiral arteries. And that stays there all the way through pregnancy. And, we, and, and we've got robust information at the moment to know about both of those sets. So we know that to transfer that knowledge, to translate that knowledge into into what we're hearing today, we're not there yet, and that's why we need more yeah. more information. But my question would be, is that in the field of hypertension, um, a fair amount of work was done quite a long time ago, I'm talking about 30, 40 years ago, with the pattern in terms of immune tolerance, because preeclampsia is a multifactorial disease, but one of the one of the elements of that is immune tolerance. And a fair amount of research was done, and we contributed to that about 15 years ago, mm. uh, about the paternal contribution to immune tolerance. And that, and, and the finding up, the study that we did here, was basically in accordance with other studies that if the sexual cohabitation unprotected, and this was at a difficult time of the HIV mm. epidemic, if that exposure of the female reproductive tract to paternal antigens, seminal antigens, yeah was greater than six months, the risk of preeclampsia was substantially lower, which fitted in with the, dis the original hypothesis which said it's a disease of multi-gravid women. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so I wondered if you've had any experience or readings on that yourself. Um, the bottom line, no. <laughs> but but um, when, when we, uh, what was interesting is that the HIV the women who were, uh, that first study, in fact both studies, um, there were a very large number of multi-gravid women. Uh, and and we'd look, we didn't have the numbers to tease or pass them out to know what effect that had on, on our finding. But it would be, I think, really interesting to re-look at that data in terms of what we now know might be of tolerance, even though we're not quite sure fully yet, but, but the new tools that we have to at our disposal. Um, but no, I, I've not looked at that. Maybe it would be good to explore it more with you, actually, that, that question. I think that's, a, that's something 
help with something new. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Thank you so much, Prof, for your wonderful talk. Um, my question follows Polly's question. Those women who have been on ARVs prior conception, which turned out to have MVM um, on their placentas, have you looked at the duration of their therapy? Like maybe those ones who have been on ARVs mm. for more than 10 years, mm. 20 years, months, and if you did, there were, was there any significant uh, difference yeah. between them? No, a really good question as well. Um, and we, have, we don't have that data. We don't know how long they've been infected. We don't know how long they've been in treatment. The only group that we are in, this, that we had contained and defined was the initiating group. Yeah. So, I mean, absolutely. We, it's, it's a hole in the, in the, in the study. But, you know. No, 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 absolutely. Professor Gray, just a question from, from me. So it seems like there's a new group that emerged. In the past, we had HIV positive, HIV negative. We started treating, but we did. But what you're saying, I always wondered about is why are we not seeing better, better perinatal outcomes in the HIV women, even though they're on treatment? Mm -hmm. But then the women that's been on treatment for a long time, it seems that they then form a a, a new immune group, and that per se affects their. So, but, so they still don't have a normal immune system. They still a dysregulated immune system. They, even though they're on treatment, they still CD4, CD8 mm -hmm. dysregulation, and that impacts the placenta and fetus. And if you if you treat them, then you change that 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 system again. And uh, and your feeling. So your main thing is: is it the is the adverse outcomes because of the drugs, or is it because the effect of the drugs on the immune system and then percent of the fetus? Is that correct? So, so I would say that uh, what, how I would interpret some of that data is that whether you, even if you effectively treat the, the, the mothers, and that was truly the case with Dolly Shekubel, um, that is not reflected in the placenta. You still have this imbalance. Um, so, so it's almost like there is a, um, a durable impact of whatever was there prior to treatment. And it's, it's, not, being, it's not being reversed. Or it's not being, you're not getting immune or reconstitution to a, to a more equilibrated balance, which is what we would find in the healthy placenta. So, um, uh, I lost the train now. Your question was what? <laughs> no, it's just, uh, it's just uh, uh, so I was just saying that it seems that with HIV, um, it was just in the women that's been on treatment for a longer period of time, even though you treat the HIV, they still in, they still an impact on the immune system. They still don't have a oh, normal, yeah. they don't yeah. have a normal balance. And no. um, by treating it, you still you change something and there might still be some effect Absolutely. on the percent time. Yes, 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 yes. 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 Any other questions from the floor? I, I think it's, I think it's uh, unfair to say that we haven't improved the situation with antiretrovirals, having been in both eras. I mean, the, the fact that we're having massive proportions of children born HIV negative mm. is, is an incredible step forward. Mm. To say that we brought it back to normality is clearly not, not correct. Mm. Um, and, and also the philosopher in me says, I'm still worried that women are, are not being um, careful about how they reproduce. They are exercising their reproductive autonomy very liberally. Instead of saying, I'm an HIV positive patient that's on treatment with low CD4 count, I'm still not normal. I will therefore be careful about how I exercise that right, knowing that, that there are still consequences, etc., etc. So, so I think we've made huge steps forward. I mean, I went overseas as a young, as a young professional in the AIDS denialism era in South Africa, and we faced great hostility from our colleagues um, over there. And, and now to have this rollout where we have HIV exposed but negative children, that's an enormous step forward. Um, so we can't say that we, we, we're not at normal and we might never get there, but, but that has been really good. 
I think for us with the, with the big one, especially the impact on maternal mortality, I think this is the one big thing that we, that we did over the last decade is to decrease maternal mortality and perinatal mortality. But I think what we meant is that even we, uh, even though we've got the program going, that we're still seeing that that, that, this, that the perinatal mortality outcomes is not, it's, it's much improved, but it's still not what we expected. So if you have HIV, whether you're on treatment or not, there's still an increased risk for, for the fetus. And uh, when we look at the numbers in the, in the group of the HIV prevalence, it's still very, very high, and that is sad after so many years. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Um, Abby, Prof. Uh, so just with regards to the earlier question about is it the uh, drug or is it actual HIV mm -hmm. that is affecting the health of uh, the placenta and then also subsequently the um, neonate, would you consider looking at maybe a pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic branch to your study, um, considering that this could be an aspect that you can explore? And my second question is with regards to the, um, I don't want to say compromised immune system, but sort of alternative immune system that these new infants have um, that are HIV um, uninfected but exposed, would you look then at how they have developed, maybe in the first five years or maybe in the first 10 years of their life, how they have responded to disease? Mm -hmm. um, th so yeah, that's my question. Is those two branches, would you ever consider looking at that um, in your research? So, so let me address the, the second question first, is that um, um, I think what's important in any of the research that I would do as an immunologist in trying to link that with, with placental morphology and function um, is, is to link it with long-term outcomes. Uh, what is what is the, what is neurocognition like in five years? What is language development like? What is uh, schooling like? What is you know, that? That to me is the essence of what I do. But I would need to work with people who do that mm. because that's that then becomes really significant. Doing this as I present to you with outcomes is um, at birth. It's a, it's a so what scenario. I can be self-critical. It needs to be related, I think, to a longer-term vision. And the first question about pharmacokinetics here. Uh, uh, um, um, certainly, the you know, which which drug gets into the placenta and what does it do? Is that what you mean? Yeah, sure. That's that's what I was asking. Yeah. Um, how would you consider investigating um, the various drugs, how they, the impact. how they move and how, what's the impact, yeah. I, I, I mean, um, the earlier comment about trophoblasts and, and remodeling and spiraling, it would be wonderful to have, um, to look in the first and second trimesters, uh, what we do, because that's, that's probably where it all takes place in the first trimester. What we're looking at at term, it's all done, finished. It's all complete by then. So we're, we're kind of measuring uh, something that's happened way weeks before. But it's, it's what we have at the moment. The last question? I think the last comment went to that, that, that is the HIV field and the, and the specific agents we use are move so quickly that every time we're getting data on, on a specific drug um, and applying it to the situation, it's it's like so yesterday. Mm. Um, and because we're actually dealing with this now and we're at the next step. Yeah. And 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 if we're dealing with dolutegravir, that's great, but tomorrow it's going to be the, the new agent that's rolling in. So you have to, it's, it just moves so fast, it's actually quite difficult to keep up like that. For me, what this uh, is, the way that you look at the placenta, separating, separating all the different, because the placenta is very, is very complex, and uh, but that looking at each different one and, and seeing where it is at what level is a problem, and I think that is what we maybe need in preeclampsia as well. We uh, so for us preeclampsia is still 
we don't have the answers. We, we uh, Dr. Professor Hall said at, at stage only non-immunology now it's more anti-angiogenic factors. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of potential I think for interaction in the future. Mm -hmm. So thank you again for your for your presentation.